first, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello, everyone. This is Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thank you very much for joining us. We are live streaming here out of the Fox 12 Oregon newsroom, as we do every weekday. Starting around 1 p.m., we go throughout the afternoon. We cover a wide range of topics here. And if ever there's breaking news between 1 and 4 p.m., this is also the place to go. But what we are talking about today, as you see on your screen right there, is spider season. Now, I don't know if there's actually officially a spider season. We're going to get into that. But I will say, if you're anything like my experiences, and I know a lot of people that I talk to, it seems like spiders are everywhere right now. They, for some reason, love my vehicle. They're in there every morning when I get in there. I don't know how this happens, uh, but all over the place. And we wanted to talk about this, just spiders in the Northwest, and maybe talk about some of the myths that are out there. And really, we need an expert to do that. And that's what we're doing right now. We've got <laughs> Professor Greta Benford, who is joining us here from Lewis and Clark College. And uh, Greta, thank you very much for being here and, uh, and being willing to come on and talk to us about this. Um, to start off, you know, before we get into my ridiculous spider questions, um, would you mind just telling us just a little bit about yourself and the work that you do there at Lewis and Clark? Sure, happily. I'm a Professor Greta Binford. I've been a professor of biology here for since 2003. And my students and I, uh, we ask and answer questions about biodiversity using spiders as subjects, which is incredibly fun because there are 54,000 species of spiders, 54,000 in the world, right? That's a huge number. So whether or not it's spider season, uh, you're surrounded by them all the time, which I see as good news. Um, but my students and I are in the business of discovering biodiversity. And we do that by finding new species, um, which is uh, the Pacific Northwest is a great place to do that. Our forests are wonderfully rich with not just spider diversity, but other kinds of arachnids. Like um, there are little things called pseudoscorpions that are arachnids, but not spiders that are tiny and have little pinchers. Um, there are things called harvesters that are also not spiders, but they're really cool and diverse in these forests. So we discover new species, but we also study venom. And um, in my mind, a, a, the diversity is magnified in a spider's venom because a single spider can have hundreds of different chemicals in their venom hundreds and they're there those chemicals are there to help them immobilize their prey which lucky for us is not usually us or anything that's closely related to us so their venoms are typically very harmless to people but for me and my students they're a gold mine of discovery of new kinds of chemicals and these chemicals are they interact with the bodies of the their target organisms in very precise ways and we learn a lot from that like they manipulate cells they manipulate neurons um, in ways that are very informative for us and can also help us discover new drugs um, new ways to manage um, pests and so yes yeah, so what we do is we discover really cool stuff that's that okay i didn't think about that so with all of that, that diversity that the northwest has too but these different kinds of venom so are these things that you've been able to use you know with these different chemical compounds that are in there and use that towards like biomedical reasons like positive you know positive biomedical reasons i guess for people yeah well what we do is pretty early on the pipeline like to discover okay. new drugs or new insecticidal toxins is a really long long process um and so um it's actually it's unusual to be able to go out and find the animals and get the venom out so that the steps of going from picking up a spider in the field to knowing what's in its venom is a really complicated process. And then what we do is we discover some very specific activities that may be really unique and promising and then hand it to biochemists and other people that might spend years developing them into something that's a, a usable product. So it's a long view, a long pipeline, and our work is on the early end of that, of that pipeline. Yeah, but it all starts, yeah, with you all discovering these different species and then and then yeah being able to extract that venom and i don't know that's a fascinating process right there um which uh, how many new species of spiders do you discover here in the northwest oh my gosh i um well uh we or arachnids we, we, we see undescribed species a lot and i tend to send them to my friends who are experts on a particular group we're really excited right now because i discovered a new species in the columbia river gorge 
um, that's uh, it's just underground. So it turns out, I mean, the things we see above ground might feel overwhelming to you in terms of like the spiders that you walk through their webs. But if you just go underground into caves, um, there's a whole other arena of biodiversity. So we found a spider called Trogloraptor. And um, troglo means cave. Raptor refers to these funky feet that they have. And um, they're really unusual spiders. And so I found a new species in the Columbia River Gorge that we're describing right now. And that process, it's a scientific process where we justify how this species is different enough that it should be its own species. And um, so that's really fun. It involves looking really closely at what I see as the beautiful details of a spider. Wow, that's awesome. A tro Trogloraptor, <laughs> yeah. is that what you said? Trogloraptor. Trogloraptor, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going to say the name is a little intimidating, but, uh, <laughs> but, but still very cool, though, discovering new species like that. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, for, um, for us who are not out there discovering them, what, is there something about this season that does bring spiders out more, say, around the house or around vehicles, things like that? Or is that really just something that's in our collective heads? <laughs> that's a great question. And there are some things. The reality is every species has its own rhythm for, for a year. But many of them, like the fall is mating season. And so males might be out walking. They leave their webs or wherever their retreats are, and they're out walking around looking for females. That's true for a couple of the spiders that I get contacted about the most. Um, there are these spiders called the giant house spiders um, that are startling when you see them in your house. They might be, you know, like this big, the size of a bigger than a silver dollar. Um, and uh, but the the females are hanging out in webs, and the males leave their webs and go out and look for females. So you encounter them a whole lot more. Um, uh, there are also these folding door spiders where the same thing is happening. So these are more closely related to tarantulas than the most spiders that you see. The males are, they kind of, they're, they're kind of tank-like. They're big, they have thick legs, they're black. They're a little scary looking, absolutely harmless. I I know but that these spider. males are just out looking for females, right? So, um, so you have those. But then the other spiders that you see a lot are the ones that are making orb webs. Um, now, not all spiders make those webs where the spider sits in the middle, and then there are silk lines sticking out from the middle. Um, but the a very common spider called a cross spider is out making these huge webs right now. And those are the things where, like, you might go to bed at night and get up in the morning and they've made one right in your front door and you walk through it on the way out of the house. That's usually a cross spider. And so those are around year round, um, but they're only making those really big. Those are females and they're making really big spiders as adults. Okay, so that's what's going on right there. So yeah, because those are definitely, I mean, everything you just described, I, I've definitely encountered, but those ones, uh, yeah, with the across the front door web. So those would be- yeah. Those would be those. Okay. Well, you know, another question, uh, there's, there's, yes, spiders can freak people out, but is there <laughs> any spider here in the Northwest that people should be worried about or a house spider that could be dangerous in any way? There's not. Contrary to popular belief, and these are myths that are really hard to dispel once they get into the, into the, into the dialogue, um, we don't have any spider whose venoms are harmful to people that we're aware of. And a lot of research has been done to, um, to confirm, for example, that the hobo spider, which is very common um, and was very maligned for a long time in the media, um, is absolutely harmless. So we have evidence of people being bitten. Nothing happens after that bite. Um, but they are one of the spiders that you encounter in your house pretty commonly. Um, uh, there, we're far north of the range for brown recluse. Um, brown recluse are, are what I study the most closely. Um, we don't have those in the Pacific Northwest. The closest they are is, you know, in central, the Central Valley of California. Um, so far, far south. Um, we do have black widows, and um, as the as the climate changes, they are they're moving a little bit north. Um, so they're not uncommon when you get down to Ashland and Medford, um, but they're coming into the, um, the Willamette Valley. They're very shy spiders. You're unlikely to encounter them, um, but they are around. 
Uh, and they're also in eastern Oregon very abundantly. So, and I've seen them in the Columbia River Gorge as well. But they're not really something to be worried about. Just be aware of them, right? So they tend to have silk that's very thick and twangy. I kind of refer to it as like a guitar string when you when you okay. if you if you come across it, it's not it's not soft, fluffy silk. Um, and their silks are or their webs are usually near the ground, and um, they're tangle silk. Um, and they're also just really interesting. If I have a minute, I'll tell you why they're sure. so cool. Go so for it. Yeah. They, um, their webs, they, they make a little cluster and then silk lines, um, they stretch down and attach to the ground and they put little glue droplets at the base of those silk lines. And so things that are walking on the ground will break the silk lines and the silk is so tough, the stickiness sticks to it and they'll lift them up off of the ground and Whoa. then catch their prey that way. Um, now, I've lived in Arizona before, and I've seen them eating lizards and small snakes because that silk is so tough. They will it literally will just stick to things, break, and lift them up off the ground. So Eating snakes and lizards? Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> they, I, that's, in the desert southwest, they eat those a lot. Around here, they're eating insects and other spiders. Oh, man. Okay. So, there's, so there are some black widows, but nothing that you're pr likely to encounter. No, I wouldn't let that be a cause of concern. So other and I've than never that, seen them in the city, actually. Man, okay, so so hobo spiders, house spiders, um, the other the other ones you mentioned, not poisonous or venomous. Yeah, folding door spiders, they're not poisonous at all. In fact, they're really fascinating. Um, my students and I like to go out at night with our headlamps. And if you live in a place that's got some natural areas with like a little slope, they make little holes, and at night you'll see their heads sticking out of the holes, waiting for prey. But they also make a little a funnel in an enclosure, and they pull it. They have a drawstring that they they pull shut, um, so they can hide in it, and then open it up and stick their heads out. So Whoa. you might see them just like dash in and hide um, with a little enclosed nest, or stick their heads out. And that's what uh, where it's people so can. You can go look for that. Crazy. Um, okay. So for, uh, for, other, for people out there, are there any other myths, common myths? Um, uh, well, the myths that you eat six in a, a, a year while you're sleeping, I mean, that, there, that there's no, that, that's a myth. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, another myth is that the daddy long leg, if they could only bite you, would kill you. Now that's a confusing myth. It's a it's a complicated myth for a couple of reasons. One, what is it that we're talking about with a daddy long leg? Um, there's a non-spider arachnid called a harvester. And harvester. So if you think about a spider, they've got all arachnids have two body parts, right? Spiders have a skinny waist that separates them, right? Um, there are harvesters don't have that skinny waist. They look oh. like kind of one body part, and they've got the four legs sticking off. They're not even spiders. They don't make silk. They don't have venom. And so those are absolutely harmless. They're really fascinating. They're in your gardens. They're they're doing good things. Um, the spider version of a daddy long leg is something in a family called falsidae. Um, we call them um, cellar spiders. They're different common names. They're the spider that might you might see in your shower, like uh -huh. up on the, you know, somewhere in the shower. They have long spindly legs. Um, so my lab has actually studied their venoms, and um, we've published some papers that indicate that their venoms are, are not, they actually will bite you. Some of them will bite you if you make them mad enough. <laughs> you really have to work hard, but the males will protect themselves and bite you, but of no consequence. You might get a little tiny red spot. The venoms don't have anything in them that we're aware of that's harmful. That is one I've always heard, yeah, that I thought was mysterious, just like they couldn't yeah, penetrate your skin or whatever, so there was going to be no, no worry. But yeah, okay, fascinating. Um, yeah. Uh, and you mentioned the the hobo spider, so hobo spider is not something to worry about. Definitely a myth. Don't worry about them. And they're really common. You're going to see them in Portland. They're the spiders that if you roll over a piece of wood in your garden that's been there for a long time, they're um, maybe about an inch long. They're kind of olive green. They have little chevron stripes on their abdomen. Um, and they, they're harmless. Harmless. Wow. So a lot of myths getting busted right here. Well, anything else that you think, um, 
is important for people in the Northwest, people in the Portland area, wherever they may be who are watching this, what's the most important thing for people to know just about the spider population that we have here? Um, there, I, I mean, as a spider cheerleader, it may not be surprising that I, I would say the spiders in your gardens are doing a huge service of eating enormous amounts of, of insects and other arthropods. So they're eating the mosquitoes that want to bite you. They're um, managing pests and they eat globally. Spiders eat a, a, an incredible amount of what we call biomass. And so they're critical ecosystem players. Um, uh, there's the, if the, if you have the opportunity to be in a, a forest, particularly an old growth forest or one that hasn't been logged and look at the forest floor, there are just layers and layers of different kinds of spiders that like, I encourage people to go out, spend just like five minutes staring at one place in the forest and you'll see little things that are coming to life. There's nothing to be afraid of in those little things. It's much of it is arachnid biodiversity that we don't really even know. Some of it's going to be unknown species. All of it is there as part of a soil ecosystem that's actually producing the soil. They're eating each other. They're, you know, making the soil when they poop. And they're critically important for our ecosystems. So I would encourage people to view it with fascination. There are these animals that make silk, which is a phenomenal biomaterial. It's one of the strongest biomaterials known. Um, and then their venoms are just a glorious storehouse of unknown chemicals that could be useful for us. And they're not, they're not harmful to you. I have learned a lot in this interview. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, Professor Thank Rodriguez, you for, for the opportunity. Yeah, for everybody out there who wants to follow along with your work there too at Lewis and Clark, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, you can check my website um, uh, or publications, uh, so, or feel free to reach out to me by email um, if, uh, if you have questions. Um, we have a, a, a spidey lab at lclark.edu um, where you can, can reach out directly. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Take care. You too. And for everybody watching live, thanks for joining us too. This is Fox 12 Now. We appreciate it. We need to take a break. We're going to be back here at 3 o'clock. We've got more coming throughout the afternoon. So this is always a place to go here between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. And feel free to check out all of our other segments too because we get to do these longer form interviews and go a little bit more in depth like we just did uh, with the professor there. So really appreciate all of you joining us. I'll talk to you soon. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.